Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel on scalability and blockchain gaming. I'm Linda Chu, Head of Operations at Forte, and we're very lucky to have with us today James Ferguson, CEO of, of Immutable, creators of the popular blockchain game Gods Unchained, as well as Yuri Kolodny, co-founder and CEO of Starkware, a leader in blockchain scalability solutions. As many of you are aware, last month, the Immutable team and Starkware announced a collaboration. James, can you tell us a little bit about this partnership? Fantastic. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, so last month, Immutable and Starkware announced that we are collaborating to create Immutable X. Immutable X is a decentralized exchange set to launch this year, which will allow scalable and non-custodial exchange of fungible and non-fungible tokens. So ERC-20s, ERC-71s, etc. With this, we are extremely excited to bring blockchain gaming into the scalable future. If you have a look at what is wrong with asset trading currently, we can see that obviously the big one, scalability. So currently, uh, Ethereum can only support roughly 120,000 NFT trades per day. Uh, we've been trying to push uh, the scalability on Ethereum with non-fungible tokens for quite a while now, but with Immutable X, this limit is about to be blown past and the scaling limitations will be a thing of the past. The other big thing which we're extremely excited about is the user experience improvements that Immutable X is going to bring and the benefits that this is going to bring to our games like God's Unchained. So currently, what are the problems? Trades take minutes to be processed on Ethereum. There's a chance that you can click buy, send money, and it can revert, it won't work. Um, it's reasonably terrifying to interact with the blockchain at all. Uh, if you're writing down uh, you know, seed phrases and different words in order to try and interact with it. Ultimately, gamers don't want this and they won't tolerate it. While at the same time, gamers have a serious demand for tradable items and a serious desire for that, but they're being held back by the limitations of the blockchain. Uh, the final thing which we're really, really excited about Immutable X allowing is that it's not a centralized custody solution. We don't, there's no risk uh, about us ever taking the assets, they remain in user control, and the users contain them at all times and they can do what they want with them. Uh, one final benefit as well, which we're really excited about, is that with Immutable X, we'll be able to guarantee fees, not just for us, or for game developers who are so excited by the idea of being able to take a small fee every single time uh, items are traded, but also for other community members and people that we want to be able to incentivize to help provide liquidity to this marketplace, we can guarantee them a fee, whether they're a community site, whether they're an influencer who's bringing people in, we can make sure that incentives are truly aligned. That's fantastic. I think what you're really highlighting here is that, you know, it's, this is really interesting tech, but still very nascent in many ways. And um, for blockchain game economies to really evolve into real markets, scalability is kind of, you know, still very much a hurdle. So on that note, Yuri, you know, scalability has been an ongoing challenge and focus that many in the industry have been talking about. Can you tell us why this is such a hard problem to solve? Well, it's, it's, it's sort of been the, the defining challenge of blockchains from day one. And, uh, and the reason is this inherent tension between the desire to build a network that scales and uh, the reason we've all sort of convened around the table, which is, is, is to allow for decentralization. So the more computationally demanding a node in the network is, uh, say an Ethereum node, the more expensive it is to, to participate in the network and the less inclusive it is. So, you know, look at what Ethereum has done over the past year in terms of uh, increasing the gas uh, limit per block. We went from 8 million to 10 million, and now a couple of weeks ago to 12 and a half million. So it's uh, an increase of over 50% this past year. And so, you know, this, this is sort of a stopgap measure to, to solve the scalability problem that's hurting everyone, the gas prices on Ethereum. But it's bad for Ethereum and it's bad for decentralization. A different approach, and we're part of that movement, is to try and build layer two solutions that sit on top of Ethereum. And the general concept here is a very simple one, a very intuitive one. Someone, some party is doing some big computation off chain somewhere else. 
And now this computation needs to be verified on chain. And this presents all sorts of challenges. The obvious ones uh, that a kid would ask is, how do we know that that computation that was done elsewhere was done fairly, was done correctly? Um, and, and there are all sorts of mechanisms around that. We pertain to this group, uh, the, the zero knowledge uh, uh, family of solutions there. Uh, but there, there are, of course, others such as optimistic rollups, et cetera. Uh, and these are coming, these are evolving very quickly. Uh, they, they've come a very long way uh, in these past few months, and there's plenty, plenty going on in the background. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really interesting that, you know, you've alluded to the fact that scalability can sometimes be at odds with decentralization. And so, you know, when we're talking about lower throughput, it doesn't just mean there's a user experience that's being hampered, but really a, a trade off to with access and inclusive inclusivity at times. Um, there's been more attention than ever on gaming as an application, you know, of blockchain tech and for a lot of users, games are so much more than games. Um, they're, use, they're a social network, they're a way to really participate in an economic market. So, you know, James, be really curious to hear what are some lessons that you've learned from Gods Unchained and its use of blockchain tech? So I think to answer this, it's important to have a look at where Gods Unchained is now and where we hope to take it in the future and the lessons we've learned along the way uh, in bridging that gap. So. So far, I would say that Gods Unchained has done a good job in its niche for uh, the early stage that the industry is in. But the real challenge is how do we take a game like Gods Unchained and get a million people playing it with a true market, a true economy of these in-game items, which is worth a huge amount of money uh, of these assets inside it. So Hearthstone, other centralized games, games like Hearthstone sell uh, at its heyday, $400 million worth of cards a year. All of that money goes to its publisher and none of that money goes to its player. And we see the opportunity to create huge markets, the likes of which just haven't been possible to build around games. In order to do this, uh, there are some things, which, lessons which we've learned along the way as we've sold, you know, $70 million worth of cards so far and minted more NFTs, I think, than all the other NFTs which exist on Ethereum, there have been huge scalability problems so far, but these are about to go away. Um, as we've been to these, you know, it was difficult for us to make 5 million cards before, uh, but this number is going to be significantly more when you have a look at the future of this game over five, 10 years. What we've learned is that the engagement around people who are involved in this ecosystem becomes significantly higher. So it's not just a game to them, it is a community, uh, we see retention rates are increased. We see that people are far more passionate when there's some level of skin in the game. And it's not just an economic waste of time to participate in these worlds. And that is so exciting for what the future brings. The other big thing we see as well is a very different CLV and uh, cohorting to what you'd expect from similar mobile games. So uh, the higher CLV shows that people want these items. It doesn't matter whether they're paying with Ethereum. It doesn't matter whether they're paying with credit card. They want these items. And what is super exciting uh, and very interesting is, you know, how much would people be willing to pay for a house if they could never resell it? Uh, they would only be willing to pay what the, you know, rental value of that is for the time period in which they're there. But because houses can be resold, there's a real market there and people are able to, spend more on that. What's very interesting is that once people have experienced owning, it's very difficult for them to go back to uh, just renting. So in the Gods Unchained example, one of my favorite pieces of feedback from a community member we got was that they were an avid Hearthstone player. They actually knew nothing about the blockchain. Um, and what they said, the magic moment for them was that uh, they played Gods Unchained, they bought cards, they were trading them on the marketplace. And when they went back to Hearthstone to play with a friend and they went to go buy packs in order to do it, they felt physically sick, they reported, uh, at what they were essentially doing, which is just spending money on an, an expense only rather than on purchasing of an asset. In order to get to this future, which we want, where we see like there's no real difference between owning a digital asset, a gaming asset, and a physical world asset, and using games to get that 
to scale to millions of people, there are a couple of things we need to fix. One, scalability problems. Two, user experience problems. Uh, gas congestion on Ethereum currently is not only a killer for a marketplace that we want for these economies, but also play to earn incentivization schemes. You know, you can see what's happening currently with uh, liquidity mining in things like Compound, uh, and that's becoming quite popular. There is such a fit for this in video games that, you know, it's more defensible, it's harder to switch out of, and it's a very easy way of scaling based on incentivizing by granting value to the action that you want gamers to perform. You know, play the game more, share with your friends, trade these assets, etc. In or we can see based on our data that uh, we're extremely close to being able to scale the game up massively, like many, many orders of magnitude. But the final piece that we're missing is scalability. So physically, uh, you know, it's not uh, crazily expensive in order to offer these incentives. And then secondly, the user experience, which with Immutable X, we see that as being the, the big lesson uh, is that blockchain games need Immutable X currently. Uh, the potential is there. They're going to be as big as the hypothesis thinks based on you know comparing our data to mobile data analytics. It's just this final piece of the puzzle. That makes a lot of sense. Eri, what are some aspects of scalability um, that are unique to game networks from your perspective? Well, I, I think uh, game networks uh, sort of take the challenge at the permissionless blockchain level all the way to, uh, to 11. I think the most obvious uh, dimension is the fact that we rely on NFTs and not on fungible tokens. So with fungible tokens, as much as scalability is a painful problem on the network, if I own one or I own a million, um, I consume as much of the network uh, either way. Uh, with NFTs, the more NFTs I, can, I, I own, the more of the blockchain resources I consume. And so scalability is much more painful there. So that, that's one obvious way in, in, in which this hurts. Uh, another is the fact that gaming, by the nature of the, the, the fact that it's, sort of, it's, it's such an, an intimate reflection of, the human, of human interaction, uh, there's uh, spikes in demand, there's some, you know, some bursts of interest, a new season of cards is out, et cetera. And, and all this, uh, this behavior in terms of demand, uh, what it presents, the challenges it presents, both to Ethereum and to layer two solutions running on top of it is substantial. Uh, and so the, the, these solutions need to mature fast in order to accommodate uh, market needs. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you pointed out a scalability issue that's specifically you know, relatable to um, NFTs and NFTs being such a critical component of game design and game economies you know, it's, a, it's an important thing to get right. And I think it's exciting that blockchain tech can make it possible to guarantee that um, a user's asset is unique and um, there's some ability to keep a re record of that provenance and the, the history of ownership. So there's a lot yeah. of interesting use cases that come out of that as well. Shifting gears a little bit, um, we talked a little bit about scalability and interoperability is another topic that often comes up when we talk about blockchain tech. James, how might Gods Unchained plug into other game networks and protocols out there? So I think that there's two really interesting answers to this question of interoperability. The first is interoperability of game assets and, and how you can use game items in different contexts. And then there's the second one is interoperability of items as economic assets, potentially to use in the emerging DeFi space. So let's have a look at the first one first, uh, interoperability of game assets. There's a really interesting way of aligning incentives here to share value and create new experiences, which would never happen in the non-composable uh, centralized world that currently exists around gaming. So currently, there exists the ability to use Gods Unchained cards in separate games. Uh, you can uh, do it even without our permission. You can take the item, uh, build a new game around it. You can always access the up-to-date uh, ledger of who owns what and what has happened with it. And what's more, though, is that we can incentivize that use case. So 
without Immutable X, there's obviously a game, developer, game developer or someone wanting to create an experience could buy the item, buy the uh, game item to get some exposure to it, and then you know create value on top of that, which that item can be used in. Whether like we have currently about 20 different Gods Unchained fan and ecosystem apps and sites, etc. whether they're deck builders, win trackers, stat trackers, um, which card do you like better experiences, etc. And this is just the beginning. This is in its very like early beta stage of the game and the ecosystem. With Immutable X as well though, we can also share fees with these people who are not just providing an experience, uh, but are uh, providing liquidity and demand to that asset pool uh, and allowing another use case and incentivizing the different behaviors we want. So that's incredibly exciting. Uh, we also have the ability to, you know, take a God's Unchained asset, uh, potentially see it inside an open world like Decentralized or the Sandbox or something like that. And there's multiple other games, like our team internally is incredibly excited by the prospect of taking the God's Unchained cards and taking the Gods Unchained uh, you know, engine that we're built around it, and then using that to build potentially a uh, you know, auto chess version of the game, or a uh, Clash Royale style game around those same assets. And it's gonna be very exciting whether it's us who does that internally, or whether we provide the incentives and we allow people to do that externally to see what happens to those assets. A good example is uh, previously we had a partnership with CryptoKitties, where you could take your, uh, you know, 2D cute CryptoKitty and bring it into Gods Unchained, where it's transformed. It's still the same item, and the eco economic ownership uh, is still the same. And it's transformed into a, you know, more AAA 3D asset that you can show off in the Gods Unchained world. What I think that, you know, ties really nicely into, on the other hand, is interoperability of non-fungible tokens and game items as economic assets. And this is where the future becomes really, really interesting uh, as the lines between games, you know, finance, reality, and just general life become increasingly blurred. So there's a huge potential to take uh, Gods Unchained and plug it into DeFi, which is something the team is incredibly excited about. So the idea that you can loan out your cards to other people who want to play with them, or even for people to use them as collateral in some of the uh, other protocols which are being built, or whether you know people might want to use them to gain additional leverage. And what I think is super interesting is that if we have a look at you know a lending protocol or something like that, when items are less liquid because they are more fungible, in particular, uh, there's far more of a reason to even use them as collateral rather than just switching in between the underlying asset. So a great example would be if you have a look at uh, loans in the traditional finance world, one of the huge sectors is that of the mortgage. Why? Because people don't want to you know, switch in and out of their house as an asset when they need to keep that house uh, because it is non-fungible. They need that house in that location so they can live in it. If you have a look at, you know, if you want to switch in and out of wrapped Bitcoin or, uh, in order to provide you know, collateral, that's far less compelling than if you have a one-of-a-kind card in God's Unchained. Say it's a mythic card, or you have a, quite a rare card, and you, or you have a card that's been signed by a certain streamer, which is a functionality that we're also working on, um, and you want to keep that card, which has that story. You can make sure that you can offer that as collateral, but you don't need to sell that and then re-enter into that, uh, which is extreme value added, we think, for both the DeFi world and the gaming world. The other thing we see is particularly interesting around interoperability uh, of items as economic assets. We've seen some amazing innovations around the uh, automated market making uh, technology recently. So you've had things like Balancer, Uniswap, et cetera, Uniswap V2. And this is a really exciting world where they can provide liquidity between long tail assets. Something which we have been exploring uh, with Starkware is how can we allow the classification of characteristics of NFTs in order to allow people to be able to have their degree of fungibility, which they want. So a good example would be, maybe I have a golden ratify card, which was played 
and signed by Kriparian, a famous TCG player. And I really want to sell this card. Well, what's the appropriate mechanic for that? We're making sure that we build out Immutable X to support that functionality. It's probably going to be, you know, that card should probably be auctioned off. Um, at the same time, imagine uh, I have another Golden Ratify card and most of its value comes from its, uh, just the fact that it's gold. So it's quite a, a shiny and rare card. Maybe I want to be able to sell that immediately into uh, a automated market maker or a order book where all it cares about is the fact that it's a gold card. It could be any gold card. And we want to be able to allow people to be able to have liquidity around their items because that is extremely necessary to have a functioning economy and a popular new economy. It also brings, you know, a lot of very interesting market making and other opportunities for people who may be more interested in the DeFi space or, you know, gamers care about that a lot. There are lots of people who are trying to do this on uh, centralized games. I used to try and find uh, arbitrage opportunities when I used to play RuneScape, uh, you know, back in the day, over a decade ago. And it's something that games really care about and the lines between games and economic markets will continue to, to be blurred. And it's a very exciting future to be building. I completely agree with that. And, you know, I think what you're describing with respect to player agency and the ability for users to participate in these economies, right, by whether it's generating new content or, you know, maybe leveraging the community that they're in to, to build new markets and find liquidity for the assets that they have, you know, fundamentally it's about players and users having trust in the system and specifically trust that the value that they're accruing in these networks are worth investing real time and real money in. Um, and, you know, I think that actually ties in quite nicely too with today's theme around the new economy um, and creating these systems that are, that allow for more equitable distribution of value and broader access to opportunity. So on that note, um, what are the implications for the entire industry when it does become easier for blockchain networks to scale? Do you foresee more competition between different networks or a couple of networks dominating the market? Yuri, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I, I think it will obviously uh, become increasingly easier to scale blockchains uh, from a technological, a pure technology perspective. Um, and you know, layer two solutions such as ours, they're maturing very quickly and the, stuff, the software stacks are, are becoming you know, better and faster and cheaper to build. Uh, so all that is in the cloud and that's terrific. Um, the, 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 the main issue is that these solutions, can, uh, these solutions can be adapted and can be plugged into any smart, uh, smart contract blockchain. We're not in any way limited to, uh, to Ethereum. Uh, but uh, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, blockchains uh, succeed not because of a single reason and not because they are uh, easily scalable. There are a whole bunch of components in there. Uh, and this is, you know, mostly around the network effect of having developers and having applications and having users who care for this thing and who believe in its uh, sort of its purpose and utility. And in that regard, observing the space, going back to say, uh, I'm, I'm a new, I'm an older guy, but a relative newcomer to the space. Uh, so having observed the space since, uh, say, the fall of 2017, Ethereum has been at the lead uh, from the beginning and from where I'm, uh, you know, from my, my point, uh, from my perspective, it seems that the gap is in fact increasing over time. And all these Ethereum killers, in spite of the fact that they have the technical capacity to scale, they have the technical ability to adopt layer two solutions, uh, they're um, not generating enough interest in, in the ecosystem uh, to close the gap. So the, the game at this point is clearly Ethereum's to lose. That's, that's my feel. Yeah, absolutely. And it is really exciting to see that there are a lot of new applications and uh, projects being built on Ethereum as we speak. Uh, 2020 has been, ha has the world on lockdown, but the blockchain industry is uh, full steam ahead. Absolutely. So yeah. yeah, absolutely. James, earlier you mentioned um, asset ownership and the trading of digital assets being uh, critical steps in building a successful blockchain game. Looking forward, do you see blockchain tech being applied to other aspects of games if scalability is um, achieved? 
That's a really good question. Uh, so I think if you have a look at the steps on the way to, you know, having a fully decentralized game where every single part of it is, is decentralized uh, and trustless, there's a couple of step functions along the way which unlock huge value at each point. So the clear step one, trustless asset ownership. Um, that's what allows you to have a market. That's what allows you to have tradability, et cetera. And that's what allows uh, these economies to be made in the first place. Step two, which is something we are extremely interesting, we have like, we are constantly thinking about is the ability to use uh, items which can be traded for money. So these in-game items to incentivize behavior. And, you know, whether that is you want to incentivize people to play more, whether that's you want to incentivize them to finish the tutorial of the game, whether you want to incentivize people to share the game with their friends, whether you want to incentivize them to create music generated content, whether you want to incentivize them to watch, uh, watch someone playing the game. There's all these different behaviors that you might want to incentivize in order to grow your economy at the end of the day. Uh, and make sure that you do so in a non-zero sum way, uh, in a way that doesn't steal from other players, but you're actually adding to everyone. And currently, in order to do that, uh, there is an element of trust involved. Even being able to have take some of these parts and be able to offer trustlessness or some guarantees around parts of it, that's huge as well, though. So if you can incentivize trading trustlessly, and allow people who therefore provide liquidity to be rewarded, that's a huge step. And that's one of the reasons why like, we talk to our, all our different community partners regularly, and that's one of the things they are most excited about. If you can trustlessly allow uh, people to get an affiliate fee or a streamer to capture the value of the provenance when they sign it, that is huge value add because uh, the streamer can then work out how much their premium is worth by the fact that they've owned it before. They can uh, sell their items to their players, whether it's through their Twitch stream or whether it's through YouTube, etc. And they can capture, you know, the the benefit of the provenance. So a great example would be is uh, in the sporting world, how much is the boxing gloves that Muhammad Ali used to knock out George Foreman in the Rumble of the Jungle? They're worth over a million dollars, whereas the same boxing gloves used by you know uh, used by no one that year, they're worthless. Uh, if you can allow that value, which is created by the creator of that event uh, and by the, distribu the distributor who wants to sell them to their fans, if you can allow that to be trustlessly captured and you know, incentivize them to promote it to their fans and incentivize them to also provide liquidity, that's extremely exciting. And then finally, you have uh, some of the more integrated in gameplay elements that you might want to be able to incentivize as well. So whether it's uh, have you finished the tutorial and do we want to incentivize that without needing to trust Gods Unchained in any way? Uh, or what about if there's a, something we're looking at very seriously is allowing Gods Unchained battles to happen where people put a card in each or some amount of wager on the outcome of the match and those are staked and the winner gets both of them. Uh, currently, in order to do that, you need to have some level of trust in Gods Unchained because the game doesn't run on chain. So at best, you know, you can have some sort of Oracle solution. But in the future, that doesn't have to be the case. That future might not come for a little while. And we think that it's not necessary by any means for the game, for the industry to start exploding upwards. Um, with asset ownership and being able to incentivize some of the key actions, uh, you have a really, really compelling loop as soon as you have scalability and user experience. Uh, the, the whole future being trustless and of games on the blockchain, that's super exciting. I'm sure by the time we get to that point, there will be things that we haven't even thought of right now about how far the rabbit hole can go. Absolutely. I completely agree. With trustlessness, I think, you know, we're really looking at a new type of economy that can emerge in games. And earlier you mentioned mechanisms like automated market makers that are, you know, crypto native and, and uniquely possible on blockchain. And when you layer that with other 
common, more common game market mechanisms like auctions or you know peer to peer direct trades. I think developers can get really creative in in how they bring liquidity to uh, a whole universe of game assets. So we're coming up on our half hour here, and the final question is for Yuri. If scalability is a problem that can be solved in the near future, what are some applications in the industry that you're most personally excited about? Well, I'm uh, there. I, the holy grail is is being able to scale arbitrary computation. Of course, your knowledge proofs can be applied to, to arbitrary computation, and we're working hard towards that goal. And with th these tools in hand, and putting these tools in the hands of developers would mean that they, instead of turning to us every time they want to, you know, build this application or that application, we can now start harvesting this long tail of ideas and creativity, and and people would be able to sort of run off with any idea they have. So I think there are many, many developers today who are sitting on the sidelines saying, blockchains can't scale, it's too expensive, it's too congested, I can't really build mass market applications there. We wanna tell those guys we're coming and we're coming fast with a solution that can address your needs. Till then, there are two vectors that we're looking at that are very interesting. One is DeFi and the other is gaming. And as James pointed out, these things interact already and will interact far more. And so the, the interaction between all these money Legos uh, is something that I think is going to be very exciting and to do this with layer two solutions in a way that doesn't break composability is a very interesting challenge that we're still facing. Wonderful. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion and I really enjoyed it. Thank you again to our panelists, James Ferguson of Immutable and Eric Kolodny of Starkware. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you, in. Linda. Fantastic. Thank you, Linda. And thanks, Eric.